All right, today we're doing another Reddit reply. Once again, we're doing a Reddit reply from the board game subreddit. Uh, so we're not going to cover Marvel Champion stuff. We're just going to go through the board game stuff. It might be a little bit shorter because uh, there's just a few topics I thought were pretty interesting. So let's go dive into them right now. All right, first one was Ashes Reborn, site or program where I can just look at all the cards by set and show all their card images at once. I got into this game recently, bought the intro box and a few of the uh, few of their decks and we're like an easy way to get the cards at once to decide what to get next and all that fun stuff yada 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 um and they tried tabletop simulator so i use ashes.live and this site seems to work pretty well um so i can just click on this cards button and like it just brings up all the cards and you can search by like a certain like die right or whatever and it, it shows all of it like it's it's really kind of cool in the way it's set up like i'm still like figuring out the best way to use it but this is what i've been using so far i haven't really built decks or anything but there are like other people's decks i believe um that you can go through and like look at what they're doing and and, and you know filter and whatever it's actually a pretty good site uh, so definitely worth it and if you want to watch ashes get played live come over to twitch.tv backslash d20 woodworking we live stream ashes a lot uh, it's a great game absolutely fine i do it solo not multiplayer but um totally fun Highly recommend the game, but this is the website I use. If you know of other ones, because I know there's a lot of Ashes players that watch, uh, let me know what site you use, because I'd like to check it out as well. All right, the Dice Tower recently did a live stream talking about the most memorable gaming experiences. What are yours? And a bunch of people shared theirs, which was pretty cool. Um, for me, I don't even know if I have like a memorable experience, like a main one. And I feel like we kind of talked about this recently. Of you know, I have certain ones that I, I remember with um like memories for um like live stream stuff we've done that has been really really good uh, i have certain experiences with like group of friends and, like you know the first time you play like a modern board game and the first time you like open like a really fancy expensive game right so i have a bunch of weird experiences like that but i don't know if one really like sticks out and i was kind of just leaving this open to you all like do you have a main experience or memory that really sticks out um i remember um one of the first like more expensive games I backed on Kickstarter was Endeavor Age of Sail. Still love the game to the to this day. Uh, absolutely fantastic game. And I remember like agonizing over spending the money on. I think it was like eighty nine dollars Canadian, like seventy USD or something like that. Like it wasn't even like that expensive compared to what their you know board games are now. And you got so much stuff. You got so much free stuff. It was absolutely amazing. I love the experience of it. Uh, but that one sticks out because it was the first like before that I was just buying retail games. And that was the first like Kickstarter I really like dove into. All right, Gloomhaven versus Mage Knight for solo only. Me and my wife play board games together, but for bigger games she's not interested at all. I've been shopping around for larger solo games and Gloomhaven Mage, Mage Knight always come up. I have Jaws the Line and I enjoy it as a solo game. What do you think is a better solo game? So uh, fun fact, I uh, I don't really care for either of these games. Gloomhaven, I don't think, is a good solo game at all. Uh, in order to play two-handed, you have to purposely handicap yourself and make things a little bit stronger, if, I remember if that's how it worked, uh, because it's not meant to be playing solo. Like, they threw the solo label on because they knew it would get more sales, but it's not really meant for solo. Like, some things are meant to be hidden from player to player, uh, so I don't think it's really that great of a solo game. I, don't, I think it's a little overrated as a game as a whole. Uh, Mage Knight, I know a lot of people love Mage Knight, I don't. It falls into a very particular pattern of like where you want to be. Like there's certain checkpoints. And when you figure out that pattern, you can like kind of determine if you're going to win or not. Uh, now, the big fun thing at the end is like the final like city battle that you do. That is amazing. But you have to play about two and a half hours to get to that point for an amazing 30 minutes. Um, so if I have to pick between these two, I do pick Mage Knight. I do think it is a much better game than Gloomhaven. And it's not a terrible solo game. I just don't think it's right for me. I just don't have time to play a three-hour game where, to me, the most enjoyable experience is the only last 30 minutes. If I'm allowed to interject and you want like a really objectively good solo game, I still think Spirit Island is the best solo game that's out there, I'm, Like trying to be as objective as possible. I think, so, uh, I think um, Spirit Island is absolutely fantastic. And then, of course, we cover a lot of other... Uh, solo games on this channel so make sure you like and subscribe and you can see all of them all right spirit fire we talked about spirit fire on the live stream we've talked about it on uh, different messages here we've talked about it in the discord which the link is down below if you want to join but this kickstarter looks interesting and they uh, had a link to it um as fun it looks really interesting as a fan of narrative games i love this concept but my main reason i'm not backing yet is i need gameplay and i think they just recently came out with gameplay too and it's racking up some money it seems like an interesting idea with how it works um basically it's no combat, right? There's no combat, but it's just like kind of journeying through. It feels like D&D &D without the dungeon master kind of. Um, 
and I haven't watched the gameplay video or anything like that because to go all in, I don't even know if there is an all in tier. Um, no, I don't think they have it, but like they have like the core box, which is $99, which isn't terrible, but then you need to add on like all this other stuff to like truly get like all in. Like I wish they just had an all in pledge and I could just give them that money, but I'm trying to find exactly where it is. Um, cause they had a bunch of stuff, which is cool and fine, whatever. Uh, so this is an add on, right? 19 bucks. Uh, this is another add on another 19 bucks. This is another 19 buck add on, right? Also available as an add on. Um, cause I don't think these, these things come in and they're all just like color kits, I guess. So I don't know if you need all of them or not. And there was something with sleeves and then, oh, this is the, the slabs realm. There we go. The other thing that's like you add on and then you have to add the neoprene mat on and that character pack bundle, which I was hundred percent sure what that does. And then like a campaign court, like it, it just kept having more and more add ons that like when I did it, it was up to like $200 We're getting close to $200. And to be fair, I probably didn't need like all this stuff, or, like certain sleeves of each color and all that fun stuff. But like, I don't know because it, it didn't feel like there was a ton of description of what it was. So, um, yeah, I, I, I have to watch some of these videos. Like I watched some of them and they were very basic overview videos, but like, I didn't actually watch how the game was played. So I want to like the game cause I like orange nebula. I, I have unsettled. I have vindication. I love vindication unsettled. I like a fair amount. And since it was a solo focused game, I wanted to jump on it, but I just, the, like going all in just seems like hard work like i just i just want a tier that's just all in and i guess they're doing it because of the color thing that like you get to pick your color but like it's still weird i don't know it feels weird to me uh so i just really haven't jumped on it but i will watch some more videos there as of recording this there's 10 more days left um so we'll see maybe i will but if you've been researching this game like let me know your thoughts about it all right so you can only buy two from this list of dungeon crawlers what are you getting what's funny about this list is that i have literally only played arcadia quest which i do not recommend to people and too many bones which i do recommend to people um massive darkness 2 cthulhu may die uh oats one oats um, well oats one we tried to play and then we immediately gave up on because it, it just wasn't for us um any shadows of brimstone we never play chrono yeah and you know what's funny i like dungeon crawler games like descent I know that's not on this list, but we like Descent. Descent was a lot of fun. Like, I generally like dungeon crawler games. I realize it's such like a a broad topic of games. I feel like I want to get into more of them, but then you're just spending so much time with them. Like I've talked about Etherfields in the past. I know people rag on Etherfields. I like the game. I still think it's good. Um, and with Etherfields, it's just there's so much content there. And like I want to go through it all. I just don't have time to. So I like with all these dungeon crawls, like I want to go through all of them. I want to experience them. I just don't have the free time to. I hope one day I will. Uh, but if there's certain dungeon crawls that you think I should really look at, let me know. Uh, let me know down in the comments. I'm interested to, to hear that. All right, which games have you added miniatures to that doesn't have miniatures? This was interesting to me. It does do people do this? Like I actually I've seen this on Reddit with like Marvel Champions. People add miniatures now and again. But is this like a common practice? Uh generally speaking, like I like miniatures. Like I think they're fun and they come with the game, but I've never thought to really like add them on on top of the game. Uh, because I always felt like I was taking something away, like they didn't add miniatures because it took away from design or you know, something else. I I don't know. It always felt like it kind of took away something, so I never did it. But Really, I like miniatures in games because I feel like it enhances the experience a little bit. So maybe I should be looking at that. I don't know. Let me know. Do you add miniatures to games? Is this a thing you do? I always thought this was kind of interesting. Maybe it's something I should look at doing more. I'm not sure what game I would do it with. But maybe it's something I should look at more. All right, Borlandia getting worse. Uh, I had purchased from the 15% site sale uh, to combine with an order I had on hold to get free shipping. They claimed to have had an issue with their distributor and refunded one of my items. Well, I requested less than 30 well, I requested less than 30 minutes. I got the full, they got the refunded email to stop the order from shipping and they're sending it anyways. Why wouldn't they confirm if I still wanted to release the order given part of it was refunded? Um, I mean, that's just companies having issues, right? Like th there's, you figure the amount of things that go into things with putting things in a system and a process and it getting processed and then actual pickers and getting your order and then labeling and then shipping it and then the delays in the system, right? Like there's so many moving pieces that like for this, it just it just felt like the moving pieces got slipped up a little bit. For Landa, I don't mind. Um, they actually get my orders quicker than they say they will because i feel like borlandia offers discounts because their games just take a long time to get to you uh in general i think they're one of the slowest shippers to me but they're still ahead of their projected times like they always give me really long lead times like almost two weeks and i get like in a week and a half which 
okay, like that's pretty good. That's much better than certain competitors of theirs that will say like a week and it takes like a month or two to get the game, uh, which does happen a lot. So I've never had a huge issue with Borderlandia and they're one of the few companies that I like. I like Game Nerds too. I think Game Nerds does a pretty decent job. Um, but those two seem to be my go-tos right now. But I don't know if other people are having issues with this, uh, with this recently. People who sleeve their cards, how do you store the game? So what I do is I sleeve all the cards and put them all together and then I put them in the box that I came in, like the, the game box. And then I put everything else in and I shut the box and that's it. Like there are very few games where like you can't figure out how to put it in. Like it, it does, it, I, so they really like saving cards, but it makes them take up two to three more time space. Do you get custom storage solutions? Like no, no. It's just, I, there are very few games where sleeve cards do not fit. Um, I feel like this was an issue like, in 2016, 2017, where like there's very designated space and it was the exact size of the cards and you couldn't go over and all that fun stuff. Nowadays, like there's extra, there's always extra room, it seems like. Like there's a lot of boxes that ship with air in it, like a lot of air. Um, so yeah, I never had an issue. And most big games that deal with a lot of shuffling kind of put extra space in there for you to sleeve your cards because they know like a lot of people do that now like it's a big business i mean there's a lot of sleeve companies out there making a lot of money um so it is big business so yeah i've never i never had an issue with this except for much older games where like their packaging was very tight and um you couldn't fit it but i, I can't think of a modern game where this has really been an issue Rulebook, why do most of them suck? Uh, but instead of uh, using space to rant uh, i like your opinion on rule books that are well done and improvements I'm not going to go through what well done rule books look like. Um, but what I will say is most people, most people think they are better writers and explainers than they actually are. And this isn't a dig against people or anything like that, but board game designers, especially when they're doing the first board game are very good at designing. And they think, Oh, I designed the game so I can easily explain it to somebody. Maybe you can explain it in a conversation like this, but to write it down, and have it be explained is much different. It's much harder skill set. I, I shouldn't say a harder skill set. It's a much different skill set that's hard to like master. Um, and it's not something you're used to, right? If you're designing board games 24-7, like writing a rule book is a different skill set. Like honestly, a lot of these board game companies should hire professional writers. Uh, or, you know, I know a lot of them go do videos now, which works fine too. But yeah, they should hire a professional writer because there are certain ways to write. And there's always this assumption with board game designers, like naturally, even when I'm ex explaining the game, I know really well, I accidentally skip like small steps. And the reason being is I go, well, of course they would know that like that's intuitive, but it's not right. And I think a lot of board game designers do this because there's a lot of times I read through a rule book and I go, I, I don't get how these two points connect. And when you ask on like BGG or some or Reddit or whatever, people, uh, the designer may be on there, especially if it's a small company and they go, oh, well you just do this. And it's like, well, yeah, I guess that makes sense, but I didn't know to do that. Like it wasn't explained. It wasn't written out. So I feel like that's the biggest problem is that it's just not really, um, it's not professional writers writing. And, um, you know, it's just, it's designers trying to explain it and the team of them writing it and then just correcting for grammatical errors. And maybe they send it to an editor for grammatical errors, but you do need to like hire someone that actually knows how to write in the way to explain things. By the way, I, I kind of do that for a living, but in a different industry. But don't I, I don't want to write board game manuals. That would be that'd be so hard. That's a skill set I just don't have. But I recognize as a writer that it would be very hard to do. And even as myself as a writer, it would be very hard. It's very hard to explain something to somebody that's never done the thing, right? It's very, very hard. Manuals are very hard to write. Um, so that's why. So don't give board game designers a hard time. They're trying their best. And board game designers. Sure, use your manual, um, but you have to dumb it down as much as possible. Uh, explain like you're explaining to someone who's two years old or you know, second grade, six years old or whatever. Um, really dumb it down so it's very, very basic and then try to make videos and then just be available. I mean, you're going to make mistakes. It's really hard to do. Um, much bigger companies, they should get their act together and know um, stuff by now, but I get it. All right, so last one. How many of you use your board game table as both a dining and a gaming table? I feel like I see this all the time. Um, that a lot of people use it. I have a I have a buddy who uses it as like a regular table as well, but not a dining table. Like it's just like a normal table in their house. And I have another buddy uh, that I know um, that that the board game table is the board game table, right? Nothing else. And like for me, my board game table is this desk, or we use a folding table, and and that's it. So um, do a lot of people is like that? Um, like I get board game tables are super expensive, like four or five thousand dollars nowadays. So do you invest it as like, hey, this is also a dining room table, but then I'd be like worried about spilling something on it and like it falling through the cracks and like ending up on my table. So I don't know if people have that worry, but I guess you would roll up the neoprene so it wouldn't be terrible. 
But let me know. Is, is this something that you all do or, or no? Is it just a board game table or is it like an everything table? All right, so this was a sweet and quick uh, Reddit reply just talking about board games uh, that I see. I kind of enjoy doing this on Mondays. I think we'll do a bit more of it uh, just to kind of mix things up because it's always fun to, to mix things up a little bit. And if you enjoy this content, do me a huge favor. Hit the like button, subscribe, all that stuff below. And if you want to see last week's content, uh, I'll put it. Nope, not that side. It's this side. I'll get it right sometime. But last week's Reddit reply is up here. Make sure to check it out. And I will see you all next time.